further ado, I am delighted to introduce Bonnie Toy tonight to discuss why we swim with us. Bonnie lives, swims, and surfs in the Bay Area, and she's a longtime contributor of the New York Times and California Sunday Magazine. She's been the recipient of a Jane Rainey Opal Young Alumna Award from Harvard University, uh, the Lowell Thomas Gold Award, and a National Press Foundation Fellowship. Her last book, America Chinatown, A People's History of Five Neighborhoods, won the Asian Pacific American Award for Literature and was a San Francisco Chronicle bestseller and best of 2009 notable Bay Area book selection. And I'm going to ask Bonnie to come up on screen. Hi, Bonnie. Thank Hello. you so much for joining us today. Thank you. For um, so now joining Bonnie in conversation tonight is Rick Coster, uh, who is our champion for read of the day on the day's side. Now, Rick has been an arts and culture writer at the day for over 20 years, and he specializes in covering music, books, dining, and writes a weekly humor column known as Rick's List. His pieces have appeared in the Dallas Observer, Houston Press, Offbeat, and The American Way. Now, last month for read of the day, uh, we talked a little bit about the books Rick has authored, but today I'm going to talk about his pandemic hair and let you all know that Rick's going to be getting a live pandemic haircut at The Guard um, very, very soon. So, um, you know, keep your eye out for that. All right. So before I let Rick and Monty get into it, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Why We Swim, and then they'll take it away more. So Why We Swim is an immersive, unforgettable, and eye-open perspective on swimming and on human behavior itself. Carl Zimmer, author of She Has Her Mother's Laugh, says of the book, Why We Swim is a gorgeous hybrid of a book. Bonnie Toy combines fascinating reporting about some of the world's most remarkable swimmers with delightful meditations about what it means for us naked apes to leap into the water for no apparent reason. You won't regret diving in. And I couldn't agree more. Um, this is a perennial staff pick at our bookstores. So Bonnie and Rick are gonna talk for about 30 minutes and then we'll open it up to your questions which have been submitted through that Q&A module. All right, I will let you two take it away. Thanks, Anastasia. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. And uh, hello again, Bonnie. It is so nice to talk to you face to face, as it were. Absolutely. Same. And, and I, I say that for those that uh, Bonnie and I spoke on the phone last week for quite a while uh, so I could write the article that that came out in advance uh, of this talk. And I guess uh, following up very briefly on Anastasia's kind introduction, it had to be, I apologize that you had to turn on your video and see this apparition with this hair, but it, if you'd done it next week, it would all be gone. So that's good. But anyway, Why We Swim. I love this book, just like Anastasia said. And I think now that I have spoken with you, you I know you to be very humble and very self-effacing in spite of your accomplishments. But I think it takes a great deal, a great deal of faith and self-awareness in oneself to start a book where within the first three paragraphs, you introduce a major character whose name is, and I cannot even begin to, <laughs> to pronounce it, but is it, <laughs> can you tell us how to pronounce this guy's name? It's good liquor for Thorson. And it's not like I had to say, well, now I have to say it over and over again. But when I wrote the book, it wasn't like I had to say it out loud for a while. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but you did have to find all of those symbols in the Icelandic sure. language or whatever they are. I, I don't know. I, but anyway, you could have put him in chapter two and started off with Michael Phelps or something. Right. But but good for you. Go for and, it. <laughs> and go for it. Um, and I want to start. I want to start with him because it is an amazing way to introduce everything about this book that I think is wonderful because it addresses several themes over the course of the narrative, all of which are eminently readable. And I told you this reads like a novel. So if you say, well, one of them is about the physiology of swimming. You know, the person in me that flunked biology in the ninth grade goes, I don't want to read about that. But it's very readable and fascinating. Anyway, this Icelandic gentleman seems to, across the board, epitomize all of the themes that you sort of end up tackling. And briefly tell readers 
or uh, viewers what what he did that originally attracted you to his story. Sure. Um, so in, um, you know, I opened the um, I opened why we swim with the story that uh, about Good Liquor for Thorson. It's a story that my husband told me one night over dinner. And, um, you know, he works in fisheries and oceans um, and the environment. And I think an Icelandic um, colleague had told him this story, which is, you know, back in 1984, um, it was the dead of winter and this fishing vessel capsized off the coast of Iceland. And Goodliger for Thorson was a young man at the time. I think he was about 22 years old. He was the boat's mate. And he, um, he was, you know, on the fishing boat with his friends. The boat capsized and he um, was the only one who survived and he ended up swimming six hours, um, six kilometers in 41 degree water in freezing, you know, air conditions um, back to his home island. You know, he followed the lighthouse of, of this. There's a there's an island, a very small island called Heime, which is off the larger um, island, main island of Iceland. And, you know, he's from a very small town on a very small island in a very small country, you know, and, and he ended up, um, he successfully swam to shore, got out. And um, when they got him to the hospital, um, he exhibited no signs of hypothermia and was only a little bit dehydrated. And now what, what, you, what we should all know is that the rest of us would have perished within 20 to 30 minutes. I mean, it, the water is so cold. Um, and he ended up six hours, six kilometers. Um, you know, that's about 3.7 miles, something like that. And he was able to do that because not only was he an excellent swimmer, um, he it turned out his body fat is um, like a seal's. And so they called him the human seal. It's like two to three times normal human thickness, more dense. He was, it was able, he was able to keep his core body temperature stable and so that he could keep swimming. And um, they subsequently, you know, he agreed to go, uh, you know, be undergo these tests, um, research with these Icelandic and um, British uh, researchers. And these studies were published in um, various medical journals. And actually my mother-in-law, who at the time was an OR nurse in Massachusetts, she remembers reading about his case, uh, you know, uh, just about like what, you know, things that, things that we learned about the human body and hypothermia and sort of like how, um, you know, I mean, in the sort of like uh, um, control group where these like hardy soldiers or military guys and they were all just like, get me out of this water. And he's just, you know, biking along <laughs> in this ice bath and, you know, no, you know, it's fine. He's just a little bored of doing it. And, um, you know, it, to me, the story is so, I, you know, it, it, it is a story that captured the imagination of the world at the time. You know, he was like hounded by journalists and he was like Johnny Carson, you know, tonight show Johnny Carson chased him down and he, you know, and um, he, it, it's a story that is mythological, you know, it's like the Selkies, you know, the, the half seal, half human um, characters from um, uh, Icelandic and Scottish mythology and uh, it's like this epic survival story. It's about human endurance and resilience and all of the stuff that we are just, we can't get enough of. You know, we tell, we as humans tell each other stories, you know, and we also tell each other stories to communicate skills and information and we pass down, you know, that's sort of what keep, what makes us uniquely humans that we're able to not just, we don't just pass down you know, traits genetically and evolutionarily and, and, you know, biologically, but we pass down um, information. We are a cultural species. We pass down bodies of information that, you know, individually, one of us is not um, smart enough to, to learn all these things, to acquire all these bodies of knowledge in one lifetime, but we pass those skills down. And that has led to the, you know, success of our species on this planet. And perhaps like it work, has worked too well, um, but, swimming is one of those skills, you know, and, and um, to me, all of the stories and all of the lore and all of the fascination around um, Good Liger Fred Thorson um, speaks to that, speaks to that very human um, fascination, also with the water, also with the ocean, also with the fact that we as a species have to learn how to swim. We have to be taught we can't swim from birth the way most um, terrestrial mammals can. 
And so it's just really, yeah, it just had it all, like you said. Yes, and so again, going back to uh, confidence, as I read that, first of all, this is, this is one of the problems with being a reader in the modern world is you stop halfway through the chapter and immediately go online and look this guy <laughs> up and say, I want to know what he looks like right. and that sort of thing. And, and, you know, as long as we keep reading, I guess that's, we should take advantage of, of what modern technology offers us. But I thought she really started this book off fantastically. Now I want to see how she possibly follows it up because no editor and no agent would say, you did great. And then the rest of it, it's just kind of went downhill. So I knew there was going to be more. And in fact, there was. But you yourself are an accomplished, enthusiastic, veteran, lifelong swimmer. So and I found over the course of 17 of these episodes of our Read of the Day book club and having interviewed so many authors in my life, I've been privileged to do that, that um, a lot of writers the last thing you or any other author wants me to do is ask the horrid, where do you get your idea question? So I'm not going to do that because that is just anathema to anything you want. But one thing that did occur to me was, I wonder if Bonnie thought of this book while she was swimming and I thought, no, that's almost just as lazy. So I wonder if you're also a surfer. So maybe you were surfing and thought I should write a book about swimming or you, I don't know, you've got kids, maybe you were watching them swim mm -hmm. or maybe you were shopping. I don't know. <laughs> Where did it hurt you? The grocery store is my ultimate inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> Wandering the house. It's actually not, but I do like going to the grocery store. I haven't gone very much this year, but you know. No, no. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I'm going to back up and, and answer that question by saying that, you know, with my previous book, um, American Chinatown, you know, I knew that I wanted to write that book. It seemed obvious to me because I, um, you know, my parents came through New York and San Francisco Chinatowns and I was always, I found myself kind of returning to the topic in my magazine and newspaper stories. And so I thought, okay, you know, there's something there. And also there's such a rich history, personal history, and also um, in this country and all these themes. And I wanted to write about different generations in each of these five Chinatowns that I wrote about. And then after that book, um, you know, people always ask, you know, oh, what are you working on next? What, what do you think you're gonna, you know, you're gonna write another book. And I, and <laughs> one thing I learned from writing the Chinatown book was if you're gonna write a book, you had better be ready to spend years and years and years not only thinking about it, but writing about it and then talking about it <laughs> for, you know, a, a long time. And I said to myself, what, I mean, like the first thing that actually popped to my mind and stayed there for, for a while was swimming, you know? I mean, it's just was there because it's just, you know, and if you read the book, you'll, you'll understand, you know, my parents met in a swimming pool in Hong Kong, like I grew up swimming from a young age and, you know, did all of the things, swim team, taught swimming lessons, was a lifeguard, all of this, you know, went from swim team to, um, you know, open water swimming and triathlons and all this stuff, and then, and took up surfing. And, um, you know, but, you know, that's, that's not a book, that's a topic, <laughs> as we all know. And so what, what are the stories, you know, and so, when I started to observe my kids, you know, really, you know, I had my, my children are now, my sons are now eight and 10 and they're on the swim team. But, you know, when I first started thinking about, you know, do, it, could I write a book about swimming? It, they were kind of learning to get comfortable in the water and loved it the way I did. Um, and I just, there were all, I think it was the right moment to write the book because I was thinking about it on many levels, you know, not just as a journalist and a lifelong swimmer, but as a parent who could see um, as they were testing out their bravery and courage, you know, around the water and interest in it and loving how it felt and kind of experiencing this for the first time, 
that I could put myself back in the place where they were, you know, a, a, as a young kid, like first experiencing the ocean and how amazing and magical that was, but also how dangerous could be, it could be and being scared and understanding that tension. And then as a parent watching them do that, like every time, you know, they're by the, the where the, the shore break, you know, you can really, it's so dangerous, you know, in so many places. And, um, you know, you could be safe one minute and then like sucked out to see the next. And that has happened actually here in the Bay Area along the coast many times this year. Um, you know, kids, families, adults getting swept out to sea by um, these waves that just kind of sneak up on you. And um, so I, I think because all of these different thoughts were kind of knocking around my head um, at all of these different levels. And yet at the same time, still like kind of collecting stories, you know, coming across interesting research um, studies or little anecdotes um, that I started to feel like maybe that, that I had a book, that there were interesting things that I could um, put together in a way that was compelling, you know, as a narrative arc, you know, from start to finish. And, um, you know, how to ask that, how to, how to structure that book, you know, starting with a question and then five different ways of answering that question and filling those little buckets with stories that were, um, that I found really uh, interesting and hope and, and also lesser known stories, right? So like everyone knows about Michael Phelps, I don't really need to, he's written his own books. I don't really need to dive too much into his life. Although I do of course have to mention him in the competition section, but also I was interested in about, in his um, struggles with mental health, you know, around com competition and also really, um, you know, the stress of competition um, in swimming being something that no longer filled him with joy, you know? And, and I think that because joy is such an integral part of my experience with the water, you know, probing at all of those outlines. And um, again, trying to, trying to think of like different ways in um, than had already been done. And so that's, um, that was my, how I kind of eventually came at it, both as a journalist, but also as a lifelong swimmer. And so hoping to bridge, you know, um, the experience of someone who is just an extraordinary swimmer to the reader and say, I'm your guide. I'm going to tell you about these stories and these extraordinary people, but also I'm just the every person swimmer too. And this is, you know, sort of how I feel about it or what the sensory experience of it is like for me. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I wanted it to have lots of different, um, you know, something for everyone. Of course, you can't really do that, but um, to have a range of experience at depths, you know, again, to extend that metaphor even further, like just that, that you could, you could experience, um, you know, it, this book just like from a story perspective, I wanted it to be able to stand on its, you know, its own in that way, but also to, um, you know, uh, trigger the, the watery appeal you know, for people who maybe hadn't thought about it for a while, swimming in that way. I think, and, and I hope I'm not doing you the injustice of oversimplifying, but there's, if I was going to put a, explain to a lay person, maybe with the formula of, a, of why we swim, it's like there's the physical aspect of it and the mental aspect of it and all that falls underneath that. And they combine to me in a way that is almost um, spiritual, if you want to say it that way, mystical, if you want to say it that way, um, therapeutic in a Zen sort of way. Uh -huh. And I think there was a period in my life where I swam a lot. Um, and I was able, quite without any help or knowledge there to for to learn about that mystical aspect when you combine the physical and the mental. And I got there, I wasn't any good, don't get me wrong with any of that. Uh, but it came to me that I was enjoying it on that level and it was kind of a surprise. And I wondered how you would convey that to a person who has never swam or mm. swam. Wait a minute, is swam or swam correct? I'd never swam before <laughs> i swam i don't know we had swum 
think. <laughs> I've I never know. swum before. <laughs> I could I could swim three six kilometers in forty one degree water easier than I could answer that grammar. <laughs> But um, so anyway, where I was rambling on with that is, um, A, you do convey how that works because uh, some people are kind of turned off by anything that suggests new age or whatever, uh, a spiritual component. But I was wondering, was it hard to talk your agent into a book on swimming? Because if a lay person doesn't understand and hasn't been in the pool or the open water, Swimming is a can be to some people like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. And that's pretty much a, a period or an exclamation point. You know what I mean? Right. Sure. I mean, I, you know, I think because there are so many swimmers in the world, we kind of felt like we would be safe with our audience. <laughs> and the thing is, you know, you may not be a swimmer or call yourself a swimmer or know how to swim, but you've taken a bath. You know, you've been in the shower, you understand yeah. the appeal of water, you go walk for walks on the beach, you like, you know, hike by waterfalls, you go to the rivers, you follow these like, you know, these, um, you follow the water, um, we all need it to survive. And um, beyond that, there is an appeal and a draw for it to us as a species. So one thing that I found so interesting, um, and I've talked about this before, um, when I was thinking about the book and researching it and, I, and people would ask me, you know, when I was kind of like waist deep in it, oh, you know, and I would tell them that I was working on a book about swimming and people would just have either, they would have very strong responses, pro or con. I love swimming, tell me more. You know, I've, I've had this experience, you know, I, I've swum since I was little, I go every year to this lake, da, da, da. You know, they know. And then there's the subset of the population that's, oh my God, I, I'm so scared of the water. I hate getting, you know, dunking my face in, et cetera, et cetera. This happened to me when I was X years old. I've always want, and then you kind of peel back the layers and then there comes the, you know, I wish I were a stronger swimmer. I wish I wasn't scared. I would love, and it, and it takes a lot of courage to unpack that and then also you know, understand that that was like actually traumatic, <laughs> you know, like in a very real way. I mean, it is because it is so life and death oriented that there was this like very common um, undercurrent to the stories of no thanks, or I didn't think I was going to be interested. I'm not a swimmer. Like, all of those stories, there's, there's something under there that is really um psychological and experiential and is rooted in fear and so that was something that actually i treated in the book as um, a main theme because i saw that and everyone understands fear everyone understands like trying to you know figure out how to conquer that and face it or not or ignore it and then it just kind of like you know blacks out this whole experience in your life um, but if you do have the time to think about it and probe at it, you understand that, oh, it is all about this very primal instinct. And so that's how I got at that. And it is the greatest compliment to me when I get letters from people who are, who say, you know, I'm, I haven't swum in 20 years. I have not sought out the water. I read your book. I wasn't sure if I was going to like it, but now I have started to, I just signed up for a swim club. I just did this. I'm, I'm taking lessons. I, you know, I'm planning this trip, you know, to this place so that I can, um, you know, work on my swimming. I started open water swimming in pandemic. Like it is just this avalanche, you know, I love hearing these stories because that means I did my job. You know, that was what I really wanted to do. I think I remember, uh, Bonnie, the first time I read The Perfect Storm, and I, I think probably everyone is familiar with that. I don't have to explain that. But, but um, there was a bizarre lunatic part of me that, <laughs> not seriously, but you couldn't help but think it'd be sort of cool to be out on one of those boats in a hurricane with, of course, the 
the caveat that yeah we're going to come home or whatever right not in any a million years would i really do that if someone could snap their fingers and say you're going to be in the middle of a fishing boat in a hurricane i go well wait a minute back up i don't want to do that after all but you're talking about fear and overcoming it and facing it one of the great things about this book is not just some of the stories that you tell and the characters that you introduce us to but all of a sudden we have Bonnie in San Francisco Bay climbing onto the beach and swimming all the way to Alcatraz, which is any sane person knows is insane. Don't do that. You've got the currents, you've got the shipping lane, you've got the sharks. It's almost as cold as that Iceland guy, but you did it. You put us in the water with it. And then the next thing I know, I'm going, I'd like to do that. But, <laughs> I know I never will, but the way you wrote about that, talking about other characters that, that introduced you to it, helped you along, pushed you to it, other people that have done incredible swimming feats. And one of them said, the water, I'm paraphrasing, correct me if I'm wrong. You're in the middle of one of these swims, these arduous swims or whatever, and you realize the water is saying, you don't belong here. You need to go home. I think that's kind of what you said. And that just sort of pushes you on a little more, but walk us briefly through that first swim to Alcatraz. And at one point, at any point did you go, what the hell is wrong with me? And then at another point, did it kick in where you went, this is great. Yes, absolutely. And you know, it's so funny that you bring up that swim because I can put myself in that uh, on that day very easily like it was the water was so cold I was on that swim I was wearing a wetsuit because it was before I tried swimming without a wetsuit in the bay and um you know I trained for it but like when we got in the water it was still like such a slap in the face it was like ice cream headache all over the place um <laughs> and I remember thinking oh, you know, it just really takes your breath away. And one of the things that you have to, uh, and I, again, like I had trained for it, I had practice, I'd learned a lot of techniques and, and um, all the safety, uh, uh, you know, all the safety things that you have to really know to do it. And still, I just, you know, I remember, you know, t taking that breath, that first breath when I jumped in after I, I popped up and just thinking, oh, this is, really like intense you know and then looking around and we had our like safety pilot boat there there were six of us swimming and then turning around and looking at um the golden gate bridge from the water and just thinking all right let's do this you know and then when i started swimming you know you're swimming and you feel you know you get into a rhythm and you feel really good and then you and then i remember hitting um a, a patch of seaweed with my hand and I don't know about you all when you're out swimming in the ocean or a lake or and you know anywhere where you hit something you don't expect it you can't see what it is I just immediately you know it's like a it's a gut reaction I just stopped and jerked up and um you know stomach dropped uh, and it was it was a patch of seaweed but it was again like it was not my body was reacting way faster than my mind, you know? And so that was like this elemental instinctive, like, you know, biological level thing happening, taking over. And so then I kept swimming and then I just would stop and look around every once in a while, just to really understand like from the fish eye level, you know, what it is to be in San Francisco and in San Francisco Bay and looking at Alcatraz and looking at the Golden Gate Bridge and looking at the skyline and hearing you know, seeing cargo ships go by, seeing, you know, hearing the seagulls, um, you know, you can hear traffic, like you could hear, it's, it's a totally different sensory experience. And like, just having that slight, like, if you can imagine the camera angle is not up here where the ridge is, you're down here now, and you're looking up at it. That just um, was a sensory, a sense memory, a sensory experience that I cannot, um, I cannot get enough of like, recalling because it was it was um the shift in perspective is so basic <laughs> that um I, it like kind of threw me for a loop it was it's like when you get a little bit of vertigo from 
you know, just not, uh, it was, it, it was a little bit like that because it just reoriented my, me to my surroundings in a way that I had never understood. And that was so cool. So absolutely. I had, and then, you know, when we cruised into the beach and like the current was really good, like, you know, we had to do go at slack tide. So in between the time when the water was, um, rushing into the bay and then sucking out back out and it happens the tide switch the change happens really fast and so you have to catch it you start swimming towards san francisco at this angle and then by the time the tide changes you have to start aiming that way because otherwise you'll miss it <laughs> and end up swimming a lot more than you want to want it or intended to and um you know again knowing all of these little uh facts and tricks and keeping them in your mind and at the same time trying to really be present I mean I think that holding all of those things at once is just it's a it's a really great exercise and you know a, 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 it just overcoming a lot of new things and I just think like you know as a grown-up you don't really push yourself to do that many things that are physically that challenging I don't think most people do and and to have an opportunity to do that in a way that was accessible to me because I'm a swimmer but also tons of swimmers tons of people who aren't great swimmers can do it too and my friend who convinced me to do it you know he had only really seriously started training to swim like maybe the year before he's like I'm not a great swimmer he's like I took le you know he took some lessons and was in the pool and then said that he really wanted to get you know he really wanted to do that swim and he's a scuba he was a serious scuba diver now but like um you know that's a different thing from open water swimming and so when he said you know if I could do it you can definitely do it it got me um I was still nervous about it because it's again like swimming from Alcatraz like escaping from Alcatraz like it's such a again the story element the myth you know, no one escapes because the currents and the sharks and right. the cold water and all that. Um, it's cool. Like in the writer in me, it's like, ooh, you know, like looking up all these old newspaper stories and uh, and finding out all about um, the people who tried to make the attempt. And then also since it closes a federal prison that, you know, recreationally that people like Jack LaLanne would swim from Alcatraz right. and, you know, do all of these um, crazy feats. And that like a 16 year old girl, like, um, trained to swim and she swam from you know someone was in a rowboat with her like this was like way back in the early 1900s and I mean that's just that's cool okay in that context um, and, and there's no competitive element to what I'm about to say because mm -hmm. obviously you are a very good swimmer but in the course of researching and writing the book you met like the, the Icelandic fisherman, mm -hmm. you met a woman who overcame great physical adversity and became one of very few people who swam the seven most challenging open water swims in the world. Mm -hmm. You met a samurai swimming master in Japan. Mm -hmm. That part of the book, I, I won't even, we don't have enough time to even go into how great that is and the physical discipline that's involved with that. You spent time with an Olympic swimmer who won a gold medal and a silver medal at the age of 41. I, I know people who are who played professional golf on the minor league tour or double or triple A baseball players that never made the major leagues. They're incredible athletes. They are so good, but they weren't quite good enough to make it to that next level for whether mm -hmm. mental right. reasons or, uh, you know, mental discipline or physical or whatever. Right. And so you right. spent an entire book talking to people in that context. What is it like to be around? Do you, do you get the, whatever it is, magical element that is in those folks that enables them to do that? And how did it, help you comprehend and appreciate what you yourself have done because there's no insignificance to what you've done too does that make sense yeah you yeah. know i um because i you know and i say this in the book i am competitive as a person in some ways right but not in 
swimming like not in at least not anymore not in sport like I just don't um I'm not motivated by competition the way like I used to be when I was a kid like to race right like that's yeah. you, many people know that with kids like you make it into a competition or a game and then they're suddenly like yeah I want to you know it's very pure it's like right. uh to be the first or to be the fastest or do the longest thing or you know it that the kids can understand that and they like the idea of being that first best fastest whatever and i'm old enough to not care about it that much <laughs> <laughs> at least you know with like a, something physical because like i understand that i ne i'm never going to be that anymore and so for me it's you know swimming itself has changed why I do it and you know it's about you know the feeling of it of of of, of swimming you know a practice with my master's team or just going to swim on my own to work you know do a workout and let my mind wander around for like an hour while my body's moving you know I know that I feel good you know when I get out of the pool or I get out of the ocean or you know go surfing or whatever and um, so it's about noticing what allows me to kind of keep going, you know, keep doing, keep living. <laughs> I mean, that sounds, again, like very basic, but and fundamental, but I think when, you know, you get to be a certain, you know, you get to be a parent and you, you are, you're in a working parent and then a working parent in pandemic and then a homeschool teacher and then all the, you know, just like all of these things, all these stresses of like trying to keep everyone well and happy and, um, you know, getting through this thing. Like, I think, holy cow, like over the course of the year, I have thought about how swimming is, you know, mental health. <laughs> it's just like cleansing. It's like allowing me to focus on, um, just like what's going on in my mind at that time or just like observing what's in the world at that time you know out in the open water and that is um the therapy or the therapeutic nature of it that i have been understanding is so essential in this year right so i don't i could give you know a rat's butt about uh, you know how fast I am right now because I am actually back you know the pools are open around here again and that, that's amazing like and the, you know I, I I did take it for granted that I could go every morning and see my crew in the locker room and all this stuff and I will never do that again um, and I worry about the larger community who hasn't been able to get in because it's so limited um, you know the people who like for whom getting into a temperature con controlled environment of you know of all ages all abilities that, that you could do that safely i mean that's starting to happen of course you know with with vaccinations and all that but it's it's by no means a given and yeah. you know a lot of pools and I, I i talk about this in the book too about um access and equity and um and when it comes to education but also are pools available to you in your community um are you able to learn to swim? Are the kids in the community able to do that? Like, you know, that takes time, that takes money and um, resources. And I was lucky enough to have that when I was a kid, um, but, you know, a lot of community pools have remained closed. And I remember last summer, you know, reading about all these municipal pools that may never open again, you know, talking to uh, people who run these pools saying like, you know, even in the normal times that um, most municipal pools run at a deficit, right? So they are doing all these camps and lessons and swim team and, you know, for the kids and they take in all these program fees and they take in like the admission fees, but they still are running at a deficit and it's like a public service, you know? And then of course, like thinking about this time where they haven't been able to be open, they haven't been able to take in any revenue and so like those places may disappear um from those communities and that sucks you know but i i, I think that that's like super essential to um kind of keeping um swimming as something that really like once you learn how to swim um you know swimming can be so much more than survival of like a of the literal sort it's a it's all kinds of like health wellness well-being, um, teaching you how to like 
you know, survive the world really. And um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I kind of, that sort of, that answer kind of got away from me, but I think I just wanted to communicate that. Um, yeah, like it's just, it's not a given, you know, swimming it, uh, is not a, as, is not a right, <laughs> but I think it should be because, you know, water is very equalizing, you know, once you um, know how to conduct yourself safely. Mm. Um, this is the second time we've talked, Bonnie, and I, I just love it. We, I have enjoyed it so much. And I'm, I hope Anastasia doesn't yell at me for, for <laughs> I hope we don't, I hope we don't cheat some of the viewers from questions, but uh, Annie, if you want to come back, I, I apologize for holding Bonnie too long. No, you are totally fine, and I'm I'm really sorry. I have got like quite the sunbeam just <laughs> right on into my mind. Angelic, my positively angelic, right there. <laughs> we know um, you're not a vampire. Well, I, I, with that and the amount of garlic that I love to consume, there you have it. <laughs> um, so before I dive in, I've got a couple questions that came to us before the event, um, and I just want to make a, an out loud reminder to our audience um, that if you want to ask a question, go ahead and submit it through the Q&A box or in the chat. I'll be watching there. Um, our audience has been a little quiet tonight, so I'm putting it on them that they need to submit some questions. Uh, but I will say, um, I'm so glad we got to hear about your Alcatraz swim because my um, social media coordinator and I were talking about that today and she was like, I wonder what that was like. That must've been so crazy. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that experience. Yeah, of course. So speaking about experiences, and we talked a little bit uh, in the pre-show about the other book that you have um, that's newly out. Uh, could you tell, and the other book, and the name is escaping me right now, but it's about the first Mavericks, female Maverick surfer. Oh, correct? you mean this one? <laughs> Sarah and Stingway? Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about what the experience of writing a children's book coming off yeah. of two really incredible, you know, adult nonfiction, um, what that experience was like? Sure. Um, I mean, so Sarah and the Big Wave uh, just came out on Tuesday. What's today? Thursday, a couple days ago. And it is the, it's a nonfiction kids book about the first woman to surf Mavericks, which is this huge, um, massive wave uh, here in Northern California off of Half Moon Bay. And I didn't realize, I mean, someone asked me, did you time your release to when the Mavericks like um, big wave surf awards is going to happen? I said, no, but it's happening tonight. So <laughs> just that, like, um, you know, all these things are serendipitous sometimes and it's, it's wonderful to see that, but um, that it what I wrote a story. So I, obviously I'm a surfer. And um, a couple of years ago, I wrote a, a magazine story about big wave women surfers who were preparing for a season at Mavericks and Mavericks is, um, for those of you who don't know, is it's a wave that only breaks um, in very specific conditions in the winter when there's like huge storms from the Pacific um, and they have to kind of come in, roll in and then hit the reef. And then it kind of rears up and it gets a very, a very steep, um, beautiful form, beautifully shaped wave um, off the coast of Half Moon Bay. And um, I'm gonna show you something really cool. Um, which is, you know, this, this is the, um, Sophie Diao is the artist and this is like Half Moon Bay, you know, and then the wave like forms, you know, when the, when all the swells come off the ocean and it's a, it, you know, can be like 20, 30, 40, 50 feet, um, faces. And, uh, this past winter was huge. And like, if you Google it, you'll see that the, there were epic rides being filmed um, by professional surfers who were coming in from all around the world. Um, and just, I mean, talk about just hair raising. Anyway, so um, I wrote this story and then a children's book um, editor, Kate Farrell, my wonderful Kate Farrell, uh, my editor, um, she, she uh, called me up and said, have you ever thought about writing kids books and I said yes <laughs> I have and so I wrote this book and um about Sarah Gerhardt who was the first woman to surf Mavericks and um and and Sophie Dow illustrated it and it came out on Tuesday and we had this wonderful event where Sophie 
um, was live drawing a conversation between me and the real Sarah Gerhardt. Oh, and nice. it was just magical. We had the kid, you know, we read the book to the kids and, but it was really cool to have Sarah there to answer, you know, like the real life questions of like what it's like to, um, you know, surf this monster wave. Um, and again, like, you know, talking about like how the details of how when you're dropping in into a really big wave, you don't just fall, it kind of pulls you back up as the wave is growing and you stand up on your board, you kind of get sucked backwards and then you go down the face of the wave. And just like things like that, you don't, would never know unless someone who was doing it would tell you that. And then um, to hear her talk about it, uh, you know, echoing all of the things that she told me that I translated to this day that she made, she meets her first wave was really wonderful. And, you know, of course for kids, it's a different thing, um, you know, but kids are just like, um, oh, that's so cool. And then they'll also ask you all kinds of funny questions about um, your life. <laughs> and I have nothing to do with the book, but then you kind of go, yeah, or, or they will say, you know, what's your favorite marine animal? Um, what's your favorite color? How old are you? What do you like to eat? You know, all this stuff. And I think um, that's great because I have two kids of my own and I love how they're, they're minds kind of pinball all around like that too. I love that. That's awesome. Um, okay, great. So we've got some audience questions that are rolling in now as well. So Carol wants to know what, what is your reason? Why do you swim? Oh gosh. Well, so the book is organized in five different thematic sections again, of the ways we can answer that question. And I swim for all of those reasons. So survival, well-being, community, competition, and flow all of those reasons. And um, over the course of my swimming life, each of those have taken you know, higher priority than other reasons. Um, but you know, like I said before, uh, in this last year, it's definitely been you know, well-being, um, community. I miss my community uh, because we couldn't really swim together that much, you know, as much as we were accustomed to, but we did swim together at a distance. <laughs> And actually, you know, open water swimming is great for that. Surfing is great for that, uh, to be able to, to um, in a pandemic, be outside together. So, yeah, I mean, right right now, that's those are the, the big reasons that I'm doing. Absolutely. Um, and you mentioned open water swimming, and that's perfect timing, because our next question is about that. Uh, Franny wants to let you know how much they loved the book. Um, and they are a swimmer, but in the on the pool side, they are interested in uh, getting into open water swimming. Do you have any tips or um, tricks for people who might be a little intimidated by that? Absolutely. Um, so the first thing I always say is find a buddy, find a buddy who you trust and who actually kind of knows wherever it is that you're going to swim. Um, so in this last year, uh, last a uh, year ago, um, there's a, there's a little cove here called Keller Cove, Keller Beach in the east, eastern side of, um, of San Francisco Bay that my uh, friends, my master's um, swimming friends, they never swum in open water. They were always straight pool swimmers, but were desperate to get in the pool, get desperate to get in the water. And so we had, we would lead swims from this little cove. And, um, you know, it always was so great to, be out there together and to know that someone else was there with you, someone who knew kind of like the currents tend to do this, you know, at high tide or low tide that, um, you know, when it's low tide, you see a lot of seaweed and, but you can always walk out, you know, and stand up pretty much the whole way that you're swimming out to this particular post or, you know, all of these things, this intel is just helps you feel much more comfortable. And then also go slow, like, especially if the water's cold and, um, you know, you really, you adapt very quickly, like over the course of several swims, but it is really important to not push the, the cold, you know, tolerance thing too fast because um, your body temperature will continue to drop even after you get out of the water. So you'll experience what's called after drop. And it's like, you've left the water and you feel totally fine. And then it's not until afterwards when you're in the shower and you're not even in the cold anymore that you kind of start experiencing um, you know, mild hypothermia. And so that's something that I felt when I first started swimming without a wetsuit in San Francisco Bay. And 
you know, it's kind of freaky because you're like, I'm out already. I'm standing in the shower and the hot water is on me and I'm, and I'm, I'm like uncontrollably shaking. And um, just to be safe like that, to have like, you know, hot tea or something to like warm your insides up pretty quickly um, is kind of critical. So yeah, go slow, find a buddy and have fun. Yeah, it's awesome. It's so great. Amazing. To yeah. <laughs> That's, um, it's, it's inspiring to the point where I even, feel like maybe I would consider doing that more beyond than just the jump into the ocean. <laughs> um, so we have just a few minutes left um, and I have two more questions and we'll answer them quickly. Is there something that you found really compelling, a cool piece of research that didn't make it into the book that you like treasure? Oh, you know, I wrote this um, chapter about swimsuit competitions <laughs> the history of swimsuit competitions it just did not make it in there because it was not quite right with like everything else that went before but i i really did treasure it because it was about how the early swimsuit competitions like you know the atlantic all these atlantic city bathing beauty contests were not about swimming Right. <laughs> it's just about you know the swimwear was incidental to everything else that was happening and then it wasn't until you know evolution of like various swimsuits and then you got speedo and the and and this like ultra um high-tech suit that was like eventually banned you know like and then imitated by all other companies like it was just like so interesting to see that arc <laughs> yeah um, and then, of course, like the discussions of gender and sexuality and also like ability and power and, and, and swimming. Um, it was it was fun. But perhaps another time we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it sounds like the book is really intersectional, which is so cool. Yeah. Um, so I always like to end and I'm sure you're probably tired of this question, but everyone always wants to know. What is next? What are you working on down the pike that everyone can uh, be excited to look for in the future from you? Well, you know, this kid's book is so new that I'm just gonna point at it because I really love it. It's gotta um, ride that wave. So, ride that wave. I wanna, I wanna t you know, one of the things I learned of course from swimming and surfing is to like really enjoy the time that you're in the water. And so I'm trying to do that. Um, I do have some things that are coming. Um, you know that I'm working on but uh right now I just want to enjoy the water I guess <laughs> yeah absolutely I think that's that's incredible and um again well oh, gotta hold it over here <laughs> Nancy, maybe you, can see the book. Um, you can order a copy of why we swim uh via our website or the links that I dropped in the chat or just come in and see us you know the bookstores are open just come in wear a mask socially distance and we'd love to see you um, Bonnie, thank you so much. What a fascinating, I was completely engrossed in your and Rick's conversation. Um, so it was great to sort of be in the audience. Um, so thank you so much for thank joining you. us. This has been awesome. And Rick, thank you always for your um, fabulous interviewing skills. Rick, I'm, I'm gonna thank vote you, for the hair. I don't know what you look like normally with, with short hair, but I like the hair. Oh, wow. FYI. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, I thank you. It doesn't look so good when I'm swimming. <laughs> thank you so much thank you bonnie thanks guys have a great night you too bye